This is Joe Mullings, and I am joined today by Nadine Hashash Haram and Dr. Peter Fitzgerald, who will uh, be exchanging ideas, thoughts, and maybe even some provocative views. Uh, and provocative only because they're able to see a little bit more about what's likely to happen in the future than uh, those that are living in the present. So, Nadine, welcome. It's great to see you again. It's great to see you too. Thanks for having me. Got it. And Peter, as always, my friend, good to see you. Good. Thanks, Joe. So as we open up, uh, I want to chat about the power and the use and the incorporation of telehealth, uh, social platforms that are now coming to light as very useful tools and pathways to patient care, and the rapid evolution of health tech. And I use health tech as a combination of med tech and consumer empowered products. And we have been living in a world of healthcare typically has happened at a hospital in this very, very large brick building in the middle of town, a monolithic structure that had tried to, and to date, had provided incredible healthcare. But as healthcare starts to overtake the cost and the burden in many countries around the world, in the United States, it's 18% of our GDP. Uh, management of chronic health is nearly 90% of the burden on the growing healthcare uh, sort of continuum in the US. Both Peter and Nadine uh, have perspectives from both healthcare providers, uh, doctors, and certainly being on the leading edge of telehealth and health tech. So let's start out. Peter, um, you're always super interesting in your perspective and you've been leading the charge in the digital transition of healthcare for decades now. Uh, share with us uh, your perspective on things. Well, I think, you know, you sort of brought up the right 30,000 foot view, if not 30,000 mile view. And that is that uh, we have, you know, <clears throat> been trying to implement what some of the, you know, economists have tried to get hospital workers, hospital systems to really bend the curve. And um, with respect to cost and with respect to morbidity and mortality, and we have bent the curve in the last three decades. The problem is we've been it completely the wrong way. We spend $3.8 trillion and we live less long than most um, countries uh, around the world. And so we're doing something wrong and we see the trends for pharmaceutical companies going for high priced rare diseases and oncology, which is important, but often the bar is low and a little bit easier for approvals to get. And therefore we kind of have a bimodal approach that tends to bend the curve in the wrong direction. I think digital health and Nadine will probably agree with me has an opportunity, not just to have things approved in various countries like we have with traditional medical technologies, but really a borderless opportunity to impact people in Southern Italy versus um, Southern India versus Southern Chicago. And, and it's really important as we embrace these digital technologies that do bring a change to these monolithic healthcare systems, as you said, Joe, we're gonna be still systems, but we're gonna be communicating to providing remote diagnosis, remote therapy to those community hospitals, not just waiting like I have for many years in interventional cardiology for the sick people, the urgent and emergent people to just come to the, the Stanford's of the world. We're gonna have outreach. We're gonna Uberize medicine. And I think Nadine has made such a big contribution in harnessing these telehealth technologies, these digital predictive processes to get better at patient care, to get more cost effective, and overall maybe, maybe with this digital technology, bend the curve or at least slow the curve from bending in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Nadine, you have become a voice in the industry, in the telehealth marketplace especially. There's companies like one that you found at Proxime, there's certainly Teladoc, uh, there's Avail Med Systems, and, and they're all carving out their own expertise in certain areas. And when I look at telehealth, I think about 
patient to patient in the home. I think about um, surgeon to surgeon peer support in surgery. I think about telehealth where it's an educational platform as well with everything we're going through with this pandemic right now is the inability for sales reps and, and educators and, and, and students to get into that theater. So your thoughts, you, 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 you saw this vision years ago, you, you just didn't think about it, but you executed on it. Where is telehealth today? What does the industry not understand or not, are they not aware of? And where might it be in 24 months? I mean, thanks, Joe, for that. And, and Peter, I, I couldn't agree more. And thanks for, for referencing some of the work we've been doing. I think, you know, at that 30,000 feet look, I mean, look, healthcare is complex. It's complex. And the more um, bureaucracy and infrastructure they're trying to place to it, the more we tend to find that actually what we're doing is incremental and it's not really making the difference that we need. And that in those incremental changes in complex systems is not actually delivering what we want, which is good quality care to every patient at the point of care where they live close to home. What you're finding is what you described these monolithic systems, which are centralized, which are you know inaccessible to some, which is introducing high variation, high variation access, high variation quality. When we think about that healthcare, how do we take that borderless, what you described, Peter, how do we move to that digital borderless environment and ecosystem of healthcare, of platforms that allow you to connect the dots, to improve accessibility, to democratize care and improve quality? And that's the, that's the challenge when we think about, you know, I've been a surgeon for over 10 years, and in that time, everything I could see was a few tweaks here and a few tweaks that are going to make a difference, but they don't. Because the reality is, is the system it's embedded in is complicated. And so what you really want to think about is how do you just change the paradigm? Let's just change these standard models of it's the four walls of a building of care. Telehealth, digital solutions, remote monitoring, all these technologies have so much potential to optimize care for patients at the point where they need it. And when I, when I started to think about these ideas, of course, in the context of surgery, again, the frustrations I faced was, Lots of great products out there, but still point solutions. We don't need point solutions. We need a platform, a digital ecosystem that enables us to aggregate and integrate multiple solutions that are going to be beneficial to every patient where it becomes holistic, personalized, qualitative, and delivering care. And so at Proxmi, in our experience, that was how we looked at the operating room. We didn't want point solutions, like you described, it's going to be useful for reps, or it's going to be useful for education, or it's going to be useful for telehealth. It's going to be a single digital engine that's going to digitize the OR, connect and globalize surgery, and deliver the best care to patients wherever they are. And thinking more broadly outside surgery, that's how we need to, that's the vision of healthcare. Mm -hmm. It's digital, it's remote, it's enabled. It's holistic, it's personalized, and it's open and, and high value to everyone. So I completely agree with what Peter was saying, and I hope that's the trend that we continue to see moving forward in the, the next. The next and Joe, time. one of the things that I, you know, really kind of have voyeured on what uh, Nadine has done is if you even look at this as a platform, not just in the OR, but think about how we're going to train new medical students, interns and residents in the future. Today, medical students don't cut up, you know, cadavers. They're in 3D holography where they can change things and actually see the functionality and connect processes and potentially procedures at the anatomical level, not just over a unfortunate 85 year old that looks like a petrified salami. That digital process in the learning and the consuming and the projecting of what that anatomical process is to what can be done, that connection at an early age is actually gonna make those specialists much more um, probably uh, um, um, more, um, I'm struggling with the word, but probably much better from a dexterity standpoint mm -hmm. because they're thinking about what's gonna happen after I do something uh, in, a, in a repeated way. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is really important once we you know, get to be Nadine's specialty level is being able to share with other folks as we end our training, whether it's a fellowship in cardiology or a 
a master surgeon like Nadine, we end up going our own separate ways and developing our own processes of doing things from a didactic perspective. We don't really know whether that's optimal or whether that's integrated into the change that's going on globally. This sort of connection digitally allows that communication. And by the way, the millennials who are our next medical students already share mm -hmm. in ways that I never did as I went to medical school. Yeah. So this really is a beacon, a, a beachhead that is gonna affect everywhere from training to subspecialty care and hopefully uh, improve that as we go along. So Peter, that's a really interesting thought. You know, the, 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 the current generation and the next generations coming up will all be digital natives and they'll be very accustomed to an open architecture, an open society and everything that they do, a shared society of knowledge where, you know, I'm in my late 50s, Pete, you're in your late 40s, uh, Nadine is 23. But, you know, that, that, that digital native is accustomed to this multinodal environment where medicine to date, for the most part, has been very acute in its treatment, very um, uh, uh, sort of location specific. And I'm curious on both your perspectives, we're starting to see the empowerment of the consumer who really is still a patient yet declared, right? So I think we have to think like that because the patient is always on. We just have not decided yet, are they gonna move into an acute setting or are we gonna help them manage their health versus treat a catastrophic event. So I've got intelligent toothbrushes now. I've got intelligent toilet bowls being developed that will, in Stanford, in fact, Peter, and your stomping ground, where, where they can check gut biome. They can check urine analysis. Uh, we've got sensors now that can sit underneath the mattress where I can get a predictive analytics on a baseline from a 23andMe-like test to tell me what I'm predisposed for. And then I can manage that and keep the monster tiny before it gets too big. So Nadine, your thoughts on the future of healthcare outside an FDA or a regulatory agency environment, how much, how much are we gonna take ownership of our health and are the tools gonna be there? And for this conference, we have investors in the audience who are thinking about that while they wanna know what's gonna happen they want to know as investors, where should money be thinking about going? I think it's a great question. I think traditionally what, you know, as kind of Peter probably alluded to earlier as well, you tend to find that there's an interest to look at the sort of, there's this impression that, you know, digital health or digital solutions have a low barrier to entry. Therefore, the value in those technology potentially isn't as valuable as pharma or biotech or any of those industries. But the reality is the impact that these digital health solutions can have upstream within our populations has so much long-term value as you start to think about patients being more personalized in their care, self-directed in their care, having more control of their care. And, and the, the more exciting thing becomes, how do you start to connect the dots between these digital solutions and create that digital data ecosystem that's trying to in real time feed knowledge and information back to every patient, to every healthcare provider, and to every stakeholder within the healthcare ecosystem. At the moment, what we see often is either things are just very siloed and you know, we can talk about it at an education level to the patient level, or we find them that they're very standardized and sort of primary acute care, chronic care. You don't find this sort of ecosystem of the whole end-to-end -end data collection brought together. And on the point that I think where we need to be thinking about is how do we enable an open platform an open digital platform that brings all of this together. We're seeing some countries doing it and they're doing a great job of moving fully digital like Estonia and you're looking at work in other countries. But how do us and more of our complex healthcare systems strive for that? Because unless we do on the health provider side, the deficit is gonna keep growing in terms of providers that can deliver care. And so we need to think of ways of accelerating our workforce, digitizing the workforce. And then we're gonna to continue to see variation growing. And so I think there's a big opportunity here. And I hope to some extent, the challenges that we've experienced in COVID have crystallized the palpability and the need of this and made the whole world and investor world and in, in, you know, the, 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 the industry look at this and, and take a really hard look at 
these are more frictionless and have a big opportunity for benefit. Sometimes these things need a forcing function, don't they, Nadine? I mean, you know, look, um, you know, digital solutions have been around us for the last uh, two decades. And, you know, Joe and his electric toothbrush and, you know, some sleep apnea solutions at your home under your mattress. But, you know, the minute you take that digital solution and you insert the word health into it, all of a sudden that attracts other people who know better than the pedestals that have been serving healthcare for the last 50 years. So when you start watching the Netflix and the Amazons and the Bose and the Nikes actually entering into wellness, fitness, prediction, elder care, and being able to provide a broader spectrum of integration through digital health solutions, you invite these folks that know a little bit more about engagement than we do. Nadine, you and I, we wait till somebody comes to us with an urgent or an emergent problem. That's the tail of the distribution. Those folks know how to urge people. Netflix has their game changer, let's say, and in California, which we're pretty, uh, you know, uh, influenced, all of a sudden we run to Whole Foods and become vegan for a while. But, but the fact that they know how to engage through sometimes gaming, it's rewards, it's um, competition, it's socialization, that component in particular is really important because now the person or patient, as you said, Nadine, becomes empowered and not afraid of this whole doctoring thing and going to that Mecca for their healthcare. Now they can engage in the privacy of their home, especially if it's issues like depression or anxiety. Now elder folks can be engaged to have dignity and stay at home and be stimulated by these folks that are consumer-like. So watching and feeling patients now pushing into healthcare rather than us pulling them into healthcare is going to be, I think, one of the most exciting things, certainly that I've seen in the last 30 years in healthcare, just in the last three to four years. So I think more people involved that understand digital influencers and influences is going to be a real um, uh, fast movement in healthcare going forward. Peter, some of the resistant. I'm so go ahead, Nadine. So I couldn't agree more, and it's it's often a discussion I've had with Joe about this this whole space where it's it's no longer med tech or pharma or biotech. It's health, and it's health that's patient centered, and it's health that's patient driven. And I too, like you, am finding myself very excited seeing how we continue to empower patients to drive and, and drive and push the quality and the demands that they want in this space uh, with dignity, with, with professionalism and all the things that you described. So it is very exciting and I couldn't agree more with what you said. Facebook teaches me not to talk about patients in healthcare, but people and health. And I think that's really important because it takes that stigma away. Yes, you may have diabetes, but you don't have to be embarrassed by it. Yes, you may have anxiety issues, but you shouldn't have to be embarrassed about it because we have tools of engagement that aren't daunting any longer. And and that that push that people are going to have and potentially interacted with social media, information technology, retail health, to be able to get some of this care in the back of CVS while you get some of your other activities is much more um, predictable and much more consumer-like than going and waiting for me in a clinic. It's just, um, it's old school and it's not gonna be uh, uh, a component of the new horizon. Peter and Nadine, so <clears throat> for a long time, we heard about the um, eye roll of Dr. Google. Um, Self-diagnosis was always viewed as a liability. Right, but, but with the merging push in technology and personal empowerment of health management and all these tools coming to light, does that potentially run a risk of liability of a patient uh, in the wrong direction being part of healing themselves? Nadine, your thoughts first on that. I, mean, I think as a lot of these emerging technologies are coming out, there's a lot of almost catch up trying to happen also in terms of the processes and the governance around some of these things. To 
to some extent, the most important thing I would, you know, when I think about this is, you, you know, and, and we don't have all the answers, I think is important to say, we don't have all the answers, but thinking through this, the most important thing is building trust through whatever mechanism we decide should, you know, people should feel empowering uh, their health. I think the second thing is trying to put some process around it, but also not trying to complicate the bureaucracy around these systems. I mean, the idea of digital health is the agility, the velocity, and the people empowerment, as kind of Peter describes. And so it's it's a mechanism of trust and consent. And so as long as these technologies and these digital solutions are putting forward very open and transparent, we're building these open and transparent relationships with their end users, I don't think you'll find that. I think where you tend to find concerns about liability, um, and those is often where the trust is not there, where people feel that their data is being abused or information is being misrepresented. And so I think, you know, we shouldn't underestimate patients or people with good, good communication and transparency. Yeah. Um, those problems will fall away. And again, the processes will follow suit. But you can tend to find sometimes that digital health is accelerating so quickly because patients want it and are driving it that the processes and governance is not is trying to catch up. And maybe that's a good thing because it's allowing them to just run, you know, a bit of a break the glass approach, which I'm a fan of. Peter? Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree with that. Let me make a specific and then and then generalize from that. So if I have, um, you know, say um, grade C melanoma, okay? I'll give you my genes. I'll give you any personal medical process about me that you want. Just find me a solution based on people that look like me, you know, biologically. And, um, and, and that's my God-given right. That's my protection of my health. But if I want something, just like in gaming, I'll give you something for something back. We sometimes drag this privacy issue into healthcare too quickly. Let's talk about security broken down into two areas, privacy and protectability. I can protect my healthcare. Privacy is something we're not gonna be able to control because the minute you get on Google, you're, you're not private. But I can protect my healthcare. In fact, there are business models today that allow you to sell various levels of your healthcare for science, for profit, whatever. That's the protectability part. The privacy, forget it. Um, it's, it, the minute you get online, you're not, you don't have privacy, but protectability in healthcare you do have, and you can control it as a patient. But again, as a person or a patient, if I want something, I have to give you something that allows them to make a much better predictive, as you say, analytic decision. And so I want to be careful that we don't drag the same issue of financial or oil and gas or other industries and just put it on to healthcare because that's a mistake. And that will be, um, in a sense, a handicap to progress. So break the glass, see where it shatters, but be able to quickly show that we can get a demonstrative endpoint that is favorable for the person or the patient. And I think that's the advantage of healthcare when you start getting into this privacy, protectability, more generally security. Mm. Well, um, the event only gave us 20 minutes and I think the three of us could go on for three hours and continue to add value um, to our viewers and actually the entire industry. Uh, but uh, I'm getting the red light from the control room here. So can, I, can I end with one thing that Please, I think Peter, do. Dean, you know, has brought to our attention, which I, as a little bit older than 40, have been practicing medicine for a long time. But today, when I'm brought into the living room of a given person that has an illness, and I'm able to surround them with their family members, and I'm able to involve more than just the patient, because usually when that patient would come home from a clinic, after seeing me, the spouse would say, how was the clinic visit? You know what the answer is? Four letters, fine. But when you're in the living room and you're involving more people, you're showing images, you actually with this technology are caring more, are providing empathy that I think I got away from 
by the subspecialty that I practice over the last 20 years. In the last two or three years with telehealth, with some of the technologies that Nadine has brought to our fingertips, I think we're providing more empathy and more caring for our people, our friends, and our patients. So mm -hmm. I, I get very encouraged about that as a more active participant in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful place for us to leave off. It always comes back to the patient and the healing. Uh, I hope you understand how blessed you were to watch this today. These are two great thinkers, strategic as well as tactical. And perhaps after this, while we can't forecast the future, both Nadine and Peter will probably make you less wrong about the future. So it's been my honor to sit up here. And uh, this has been Joe Mullings from 160 Studios. Be well.